Well, I just uh, wanted to begin by reading in a couple of places in John's Gospel, first in John chapter 12. John's Gospel chapter 12 and um, verse 30, John 12, 30. Jesus answered and said, this voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. Then over in John chapter 19, John chapter 19 and verse 25. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. There stood by the cross of Jesus. The, um, the title that I've, I've given this message is Near the Cross, and I realize that maybe needs a little bit of explanation. Um, what I'd like to do with the Lord's help is to consider the person of the Lord Jesus, and then you might say take a trip with him to the cross of Calvary, and then look in the epistles um, at um, some places uh, where the word of God mentions the cross of Christ. And I'd like to focus on some, some practical effects of um, staying close to the cross of Christ in our hearts and in our minds. So we read in, um, here in, in John 19, verse 25, that there were women standing by the cross of the Lord Jesus. Literally and physically, there were women at the cross. They were watching the Savior suffer. They were watching him die. Now, we um, as believers today don't have that opportunity to physically stand by the cross of the Lord Jesus, but I believe we do have the opportunity to stay close to the cross in our minds and in our hearts and, and regularly visit it in that way. There's a hymn in um, the Little Flock hymn book. Um, it's number 71 in the appendix. It says, um, O my Savior, crucified, near thy cross would I abide, gazing with adoring eye on thy dying agonies. And when we think of the Lord Jesus lifted up on the cross, it really does draw us to him. We see the love of God um, manifested um, like it never was before. And the love of Christ constrains us. It draws us near to the Lord Jesus. There was um, uh, a sister in Christ, a woman named Fanny Crosby. And, and maybe many here have heard of her. She, um, she lived in the 1800s here in the U.S., my children and I just um, read a biography on her, so it's a little bit fresh in my mind. But uh, Fanny Crosby was was blind almost from birth, but she was raised up by God in a very special way um, to write many, many hymns, beautiful hymns, um, exalting the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and she wrote one hymn in particular called Near the Cross. And there's a stanza in that hymn that kind of expresses, I guess, what I what I have on my heart today. It says, near the cross, O Lamb of God, bring its scenes before me. Help me walk from day to day with its shadow o'er me. Living day to day in the shadow of the cross. There's, I believe, so much blessing in that. It gives us the right perspective just as we go through, through basic experiences of life. Maybe we're, we're disappointed or we're lonely or we're um, feeling excluded in some way or we're feeling physical pain. And we go to the cross in our minds, in our hearts, and we see the Lord Jesus experiencing all those things in an extreme way. And it puts a whole different light, a whole different perspective on what we may be going through. So the Apostle Paul says, God um, forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what you and I as believers are called to do, to glory in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's loved us. He's bought us with a price, redeemed us with his precious blood. And now we have the opportunity to stand by the cross, to visit the cross in our, in our hearts, and to stay near to him in that way. But what makes the cross, I believe, so meaningful to us is the person that hung there. So I, I'd like to go to John's Gospel, chapter 1, to um, consider a few thoughts on the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. So John's Gospel, chapter 1, please.
John chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Then verse 9. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. You know, when we think about the Lord Jesus, we're talking about the creator. We're talking about the son of God. Um, And it says here that all things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. I heard recently that that there's an estimated 200 billion galaxies in this universe, in what they call the the observable universe. And they say there's there's probably a lot more, and they're discovering more as technology um, increases and advances. But just think of it, the Lord Jesus, the Son of God, was the one responsible for creating those galaxies. He's the, the God of galaxies, the creator of galaxies. He, he flung them into space just simply by the word of his power. Um, He's the creator. He's also the sustainer. Um, The word of God says that by him, all things subsist. He's holding it all together. Every molecule, every cell in your body and my body, he's holding it together. Our breath is in his hands. But here's, here's the amazing thing. In verse 10, he was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not. The world knew him not. He would, he would come into this world in, in the most humble form, that of a little tiny baby um, who had to be swaddled um, and born into, into such poor circumstances, a family with, without any prestige, Joseph and Mary. Um, that was how he chose to come into this world. You know, in our assembly here in Spokane and in, in recent years, the Lord has, has so kindly um, given us uh, a number of children that have been born, and um, actually any day now, there's a there's a family in, in this assembly that that looks forward to welcoming another um, little baby. And these children in our assembly are are being born into wonderful circumstances. They're born in nice hospitals with with uh, excellent medical care and, and highly trained um, you know pro- medical professionals. And then they they come home with their parents to. Uh, a nicely decorated nursery, but the Lord Jesus had none of that. Uh, uh, he's born in an, an animal shed, and you know, an animal feed trough is is his crib, his cradle. But that was how he he chose to come. There's a there's a poem. I I really enjoy some of these poems that have been written and hymns that have been written that bring out these these truths about the Lord Jesus from Scripture in such a touching way. So I'll. I'll be quoting a few poems. I hope that's okay. I hope uh, everyone can still understand the thought. But one of my favorite poems um, about the Lord Jesus is by Mr. Darby. It's called The Man of Sorrows. And he he traces out the life of the Lord Jesus from from the manger to the cross. And when he he gets to the birth of the Lord Jesus, he, he describes it like this. He says, oh, strange yet fit beginning of all that life of woe in which thy grace was winning for man is god to know it was a strange beginning that the lord jesus had when you think about you know the son of god coming from all that glory with the father all the way down to that manger in bethlehem that's very very strange but at the same time it was a very fit beginning it was appropriate for the Lord to be born in that way, to come to this earth in that way, because that was the character of his life as, as someone who was naturally speaking poor, yet going about enriching many. There's another hymn that was written. I'm not sure who wrote it, but it says this, down from his glory, ever living story, my God and Savior came and Jesus was his name, born in a manger to his own, a stranger. A man of sorrows, tears, and agony. This was, this was God in the flesh. God was manifest in the flesh. God in a human body, a child born, a son given. 
you know, I often marvel when I when I think about a little baby, um, such a small body, a small human being, you know, maybe seven or, or eight pounds. But the word of God says in the Lord Jesus, in him, all the fullness of the Godhead was pleased to dwell. And and I don't mean to be irreverent, but it almost seems in my mind like the God who inhabits eternity would would almost condense himself in the body of a little infant. In him, all the fullness of the Godhead was pleased to dwell. And we have a hymn. It says, in the most perfectly expressed, the Father's self doth shine, fullness of Godhead to the blessed, eternally divine, all fullness of the Godhead dwelling in the person of the Lord Jesus. And I believe that was the case from day one when he came into this world. He's the brightness of God's glory, the great I am, Emmanuel, the Alpha and Omega, that that little baby, that 12-year-old boy in Jerusalem, that that young Jewish man in Palestine was, as Daniel calls, the ancient of days. But if you and I were to see him, Physically, literally, with our eyes, we would see a very unassuming person, someone who was incredibly humble, um, with no desirable beauty. You know, someone has said that that beauty is the gold coin of human worth. Naturally, we don't see as God sees, we see as men see. And and we often measure people and their worth by by what we can see of human beauty. Well, the Lord Jesus didn't have much, if any of that, as Isaiah tells us, no beauty, no no outward beauty that he should be desired. But it says there in verse 10, the world knew him not. What, what a statement. You know, the Lord Jesus says in, I think it's in Luke's gospel, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man had nowhere to lay his head. He was, he was turned away from day one. No, no room for him there in the inn. And often it seems like the Lord Jesus didn't have a place to call home, a place to lay his head. And there's a, there's a beautiful hymn. Um, I think it's number 27 in our, our little flock hymn book. It says the Lord Jesus would, would wander as a homeless stranger in the world. His hands had made the Son of God. Um, his, his Godhead glory veiled in, in the man, Christ Jesus, mostly veiled, and he's walking among men. Deity that was veiled, aside he threw his, his most divine array and veiled his Godhead in a, in a robe of clay. And in that garb did wondrous love display, restoring what he never took away. Those are the words of a, of a poet. Um, he was so human. He was, he was fully God, the fullness of the Godhead dwelling in him. But he was completely human. And it's interesting to read through the Gospels. The Lord Jesus would cross paths with different people. And they often just would take him. <clears throat> excuse me. They would often just take him to be an ordinary person. Think of the woman at the well. When the Lord Jesus speaks to her and asks her for a drink of water. She responds kind of, kind of rudely to the Lord Jesus. Basically, she says, who are you? And, and why are you talking to me? She didn't think him to be anything special. But the Lord Jesus says to her, if, if you only knew, if you only knew who it was that was speaking to you, you would be the one asking me for a drink. And we know through the, through the grace of God, she did come to see who he was. And sometimes people would get a glimpse that this was not just an ordinary person. Like when he would calm the storm, they would say, what manner of, of men is this that even the, the winds and the seas would obey him? And John says here in verse 14, a beautiful verse, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Sometimes that, that glory, that, that personal official glory that the Lord Jesus had as Son of God, was, was revealed to those um, through the eye of faith. And they would see the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The Lord Jesus would live a perfect life, and he would be, he would be scrutinized throughout his life. He would be closely watched 
closely observed. Um, people would try to catch him in his words, but all they would see was, was sinless perfection. A man who did no sin, knew no sin, and in him was no sin, the word of God tells us. You know, in, in this country, the U.S., we're, we're getting ready to have our our elections. Our presidential election is going to happen um, in about a month or so here. And there's a lot of hype about that. And, and as the candidates are campaigning, they they love to scrutinize the other candidate and and observe areas in their life where they're they made mistakes or where they're weak. And then as they're campaigning, they, they really try to make a lot of the other person's mistakes to show that that is not the candidate that you want to choose. But if, if you were to look at my life or anyone else's life, you would see a lot of flaws because we're, we're fallen people. We're sinful creatures. There, there's a lot of mistakes, a lot of material there to, to criticize. But the Lord Jesus, after being closely watched and, and scrutinized, there was nothing on him. And, and toward the end of his life, um, the Lord Jesus could look his enemies in the face, you know, eye to eye and say, which of you convinceth me of sin? They had nothing on him. But he was also closely observed by, by God, his father. And we have those, those silent years in scripture uh, about the life of the Lord Jesus. We have a little bit in scripture about his birth. Um, just one one glimpse of his life as a 12-year-old boy, but then we don't really read of anything uh, about the Lord Jesus until he's 30 years old, which I think is is a mark of, of inspiration, because if humans were to write that story, they would have included all those details of his upbringing. The Word of God doesn't. It's silent on those years, but what was going on during that time, you know, basically the first 30 years of his life? I believe the Lord Jesus was being observed by God his Father, and at his baptism, when he's 30 years old, there's that voice from heaven that says, this is my son, in whom, my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. And the Spirit of God comes down on the Lord Jesus, descends on him like a, a dove to, you might say, um, confirm that, that this is the clean place where the dove can land, where the dove can rest. This is the one who is holy, harmless, undefiled and separate from sinners what what a person that 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 god presents to us in his son this is the lord jesus perfect person flawless life i, I often think about the lord jesus um, getting to the end of each day and, and never having any regrets as far as as far as his conduct or behavior went he never got to the end of the day and wished he did something that he hadn't done or, or, or wished he hadn't done something that he did. He, he always went to the end of the day, maybe sometimes disappointed, but always satisfied because he could say, I do always, always those things that please my father. He's altogether lovely. Let's go to um, Luke's gospel, chapter nine, just to read one verse, Luke chapter nine. Luke 9 and verse um, 51. And it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. The time was come that he should be received up. I've, I've pondered that a little bit, and, and I hope to get some, some help from others on that. But what that means to me, and I hope this is correct, that the Lord Jesus reached a point in his life when from an earthly standpoint, his job was finished. He could go back to heaven and he could be received there. He had done everything he needed to do to show the heart of God the Father, everything he needed to do to declare the truth of God. And now he had done it perfectly. His job was done. He could go back. But this is the very point where he sets his face and he goes to Jerusalem and he goes to the cross. And this is perhaps the point in the life of the Lord Jesus where he, he properly um, fulfills that type of the Hebrew servant there in, there in Exodus um, who had served that term of seven years. And he could go out free, but he says, I love my master. 
my wife and my children. I will not go out free. His ear was was bored through with an all. He'd be a servant forever. And this is perhaps where the Lord Jesus fulfilled that type. He could have gone back to heaven. He could have been received. But he sets his face and he goes to Jerusalem and shows his his, his full and total commitment uh, to the will of God the Father and to souls. The Son of Man had come to seek and to save that which was lost. And he came first and foremost to do the will of him that sent him. He could have gone out free, but instead the Son of Man must suffer many things. And he goes to Jerusalem. He does just that. The good shepherd would give his life to the sheep. Let's go to Matthew 27 and read about the Lord Jesus now um, on the cross. Matthew 27. Matthew 27 and verse um, 22. Matthew 27, 22. Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? They all say unto him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why, what evil hath he done? But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. Then released he Barabbas unto them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. And they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit upon him and took the reed and smote him on the head. And after that, they had mocked him. They took the robe off from him and put his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. And as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. And when they were come unto a place called Golgotha, that is to say, a place of a skull, they gave him vinegar to drink, mingled with gall. And when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there. Now the Lord Jesus has been taken by, by wicked hands. He's been scourged. His, his back has been plowed like a field. They would spit on him. They would even spit on his face. He's mocked. He's, he's spiked to a cross. His hands and his feet are pierced. And, you know, Scripture tells us that his heart was broken. I think Psalm 69 he says, reproach hath broken my heart. The sorrow flooded his heart. The waters came into his soul. But remember from our reading in John 1, um, who it is that's hanging on the cross. This is the creator. This is the son of God giving himself on the cross. As, as a poet said, the, the maker of the universe as man for man was made a curse. He's the lamb of God without blemish. And without spot, presenting himself to God as the sacrifice for sin, as the burnt offering, a sweet savor, and a, and a beautiful aroma going up to God. Um, and despite all the, the abuse and the torture that was inflicted on the Lord Jesus, there was one act of human mercy. Um, notice in verse 20, uh, rather 34, that we read, verse 20, 34 of Matthew 27, they gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gall and when he tasted thereof he would not drink um, i understand that that they would offer this um this liquid vinegar mingled with gall to someone being crucified to kind of sedate them sort of dull their senses and make them not feel the pain quite as badly um, that was an act of human mercy um but the lord jesus refuses it he refuses it why because 
he was going to be there on the cross in full awareness. He was going to bear our sins in his own body on the cross in full awareness. And you read of the Lord Jesus saying, um, you know, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, things like that. The Lord Jesus was very aware as he was on the cross. There was nothing that would sedate him, nothing that would 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 dull his senses or dull the pain that he was experiencing. Yesterday in our in our remembrance meeting here in Spokane, um, we uh, we sang hymn number thirty seven. Um, oh Christ, what burdens bowed thy head? But there was um, one stanza in particular that um, that touched me as we sang it. It's uh, well, let me open up my hymn book here. Hymn number one thirty seven in that little flock. One stanza. It said, uh, "The tempest's awful voice was heard. O Christ, it broke on thee. Thy opened." Bosom was my ward. It bore the storm for me. Thy open bosom was my ward. It's almost like the Lord Jesus was fully exposed on the cross, fully exposed to everything that sinful man and everything that Satan could throw at him. Um, but what's worse is that he he was also exposed to the judgment of God against sin. And let's read about that in um, verse 45, here in Matthew 27, verse 45. Now from the sixth hour, there was a darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Bearing our sins in his own body on the tree, he's made sin. He's punished by God for sin. You know, usually in scripture, the wrath of God is mixed with mercy. We can see hints of God's mercy, even when he um, carries out judgment. And so the scripture says in wrath, he remembers mercy. But on the cross, it was unmixed wrath. It was pure wrath. The cup was full. It was poured out on the Lord Jesus, pure wrath. And again, in that, that poem, Man of Sorrows by Mr. Darby, he, he puts it like this. He says, O day of deepest sorrow, day of unfathomed grief, when thou didst taste the horror of wrath without relief. Wrath without relief is what the Lord Jesus was experiencing here as he is hanging on the cross in the three hours of darkness, completely abandoned by God. The waters under heaven were gathered together unto one place. Deep called out to deep. The Lord Jesus would go down to the very bottom, to the lowest pit. And Isaiah, um, the prophet, tells us that his visage was so marred more than any man. And I, I've pondered that. Maybe you have too. What does it mean that the, the visage of the Lord Jesus was marred? You know, the visage um, is like the face of a person, kind of their appearance. And it often represents kind of the, the whole person in general. And so if that's the case, I, I believe the Lord Jesus' visage being marred is more than just his physical disfigurement. Because many people have been, been horribly injured and, and disfigured in war and, and accidents and, and that kind of thing. But I've heard it suggested, and I, I like this thought, that the Lord Jesus was marred more than any man because he was the only person to ever experience the full judgment of God against sin. So in that way, his, his person was marred, spirit, soul, and body. But it says also in Isaiah 53 that he was bruised and wounded for our iniquities, our sins, but it pleased the Lord to bruise him. God was satisfied by the sacrifice that was going up, the aroma that was going up to heaven, as finally now there was an answer to sin. God's righteousness and holiness were being satisfied as the Lord Jesus was suffering and paying the price, giving all that he had there at the cross. God was manifesting his love, providing himself a lamb for the burnt offering, his own son. And here's a here's a poem that I, I got from a daily devotional that, that touched me. 
He describes it like this. Who thy love, O God, can measure. Love that found in Christ its pleasure. Love that crushed for us its treasure. Christ, thy son of love. We feel loved when we think about the cross, what the Lord Jesus gave, and what God would do to his own son there at the cross. The Lord Jesus gave everything he had to pay the ransom price, and it, he looks for a response from our hearts. We hear him say, this do in remembrance of me. We draw near to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ in our hearts, and at his supper, his remembrance we draw near to the cross of the Lord Jesus as an assembly and we announce his death one more time before he comes. But we don't leave the Lord Jesus on the cross. He, he laid down his life. He gave himself. He said it is finished. And he did die. The blood came out of his side, out of the side of his body. But we don't leave him on the cross because today he's not a dead Christ. He's a living Christ. And let's read a, a little bit about his resurrection in Matthew 28. In the end, uh, Matthew um, 28, verse 1. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the woman, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, come see the place where the Lord lay. Well, it mentions in verse 2, at the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, that there was a great earthquake. Um, and we we also know that there was an earthquake at the cross. We didn't read about it, but back in um, Matthew 27 and verse um, 51, it says, The earth did quake, and the rocks rent. And now, once again, there's a, uh, an earthquake at his resurrection. And um, someone put it like this um, very wonderfully. The ground shook with palsy when its creator died. Palsy is like a, a disease, a sickness that sometimes causes people to lose control of their body movements. The ground shook with palsy when its creator died, but it shook with pleasure when he rose again. And the Apostle Paul speaks of the, the exceeding greatness of his power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead, an incredible act of God's power was, was the resurrection when he, he broke through all those forces of evil to raise the Lord Jesus from the dead. And today, the Lord Jesus, after having tasted death for everything, he's crowned with glory and honor. He's at God's right hand. And the hymn says, now to God's right hand exalted with thy praise. The heavens resound. Heaven is resounding with the praise of the Lord Jesus Christ, the worthy Lord Jesus Christ, as he's um, glorified, he's taken seat at God's right hand. Um, but he's a man there. He's there with wounds in his hands, his feet, and his side, and there he is waiting for us, waiting for his bride. And, and you know, what? what is it going to be like to... See the Lord Jesus face to face for the very first time. What is the hymn says, I shall know him by the print of the nails in his hands. So we have been, been died for by the Lord Jesus, the Son of God. God has paid the highest possible price for you and for me and the cross matters not just when it comes to our salvation but the cross matters when it comes to um, the lives that we live the path that we walk day to day as believers and in the gospels matthew mark luke and john we have the facts of the cross and in the epistles we have the the teaching of the cross 
where, where inspired writers show us what the cross really means in the context of, uh, of Christianity. And the cross is mentioned in quite a few different places uh, in the epistles, but I'd like to just look at, at three places in the epistles where the word of God brings us back to the cross and try to see the, the, the practical effect that, that it produces when we stay near the cross in our hearts. So let's go to um, Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6 to see a, a practical blessing of uh, being near the cross. Romans 6 and verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ um, were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him, for in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Well, you might have noticed in these verses here that we read in Romans 6 that the word cross is not is not technically mentioned. I don't believe that the word cross is mentioned in, in this epistle um, of Romans, at least not in the King James Version of the Bible. But I believe that the truth of the cross is definitely here. Paul refers to the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus along with his death. Um, and this is an in incredible chapter in, in the Word of God, one that I don't pretend to understand very, very deeply or fully. But the question that Paul is answering here is, how can we as believers um, be delivered practically from sin in our lives? And to answer that, he, he brings us back to the cross of the Lord Jesus, and he makes an incredible statement that, that we have died with the Lord Jesus. Our old man is crucified with Christ. When Christ was crucified, we were crucified too. Our old man, everything um, that we are in Adam, all the sinful features that we inherited was done away with there at the cross. But there's even a brighter side to it. We're also raised with him um, in that new creation and we walk in newness of life. That That is how God sees us. That is how God sees our standing as believers identified with his death, identified with his resurrection. Um, and there's there's sort of three key words in, in these verses. Someone has pointed this out, and it's been very helpful to me. The three key words are know and reckon and yield. So in verse three, it says, know ye not. And then in verse six, it says, knowing this. And then verse nine, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead so forth. Um, these are our facts that God is telling us that, that we are to know in our minds. But then in verse 11, it says, likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's something we are to reckon. And that's something that happens in our minds. We, we agree with what God has said, but then it goes on in verse 13 to talk about yielding. We're to to yield ourselves and to allow righteousness to be 
our new master rather than sin. But, but that word reckon means we consider it to be so. It, it starts in our minds. And I, I don't mean to make this like an, an intellectual thing or anything, but I believe the scripture is calling us to have a right thought process here where we go back to the cross in our minds. We consider the Lord Jesus hanging there, suffering and dying, and, and consider the fact that we are identified with him. We see our old selves having died there with him, but we're also risen with him. And there is, is incredible power, practical power in, in that truth, that thought process that God is giving to us. And as it reaches our hearts, we begin to yield. Things that we know, things that we reckon to be true in our minds, and then things that we then yield to so that righteousness would reign in our, our members, in our lives. Um, incredible power stored up in this truth. And as we um, follow this truth and, and live it out, I, I believe those those sinful passions and desires we have begin to just kind of wither away. Um, and this is something that that I'm very much learning. I don't pretend to have learned this. I do wish that as a young person, I really would have spent more time in Romans 6. But the, this is God's way of righteousness, God's way of practically delivering us from sin in our lives so that the power of grace would reign through through righteousness. Um, so staying close to the cross produces this deliverance, this deliverance from sin. And that's what leads to, to liberty in our lives. Notice verse 22 of Romans 6, it says, But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Now being made free from sin. That's liberty. And, you know, I think of um, what Paul says to the Galatians. I don't know if I can quote it exactly off the top of my head, but he tells them to stand fast in the liberty that they have in Christ. There's a, there's a friend of mine um, who, uh, who, who has a Catholic background. I've known him for 11 and a half, going on 12 years. And there's no doubt in my mind that he is, he is the Lord's. He is a child of God. He has new life and he has those um, righteous desires, those holy desires. But he has a very, very works-based mindset. Um, trying to gain merit with God and trying to burn out the old nature and things like that. But whenever I visit with him, I, there's one thing that really stands out to me that he's missing, and that is the liberty that we can have as believers in the finished work of Christ. God wants us to know freedom. He wants us to know liberty. And I believe we discover that through this, this truth here that Romans gives us as to God's way for, for the practical deliverance from sin. And may, may you and I know something of this deliverance that comes from going back to the cross and seeing ourselves having been crucified there, the old man crucified with Christ, dead with Christ. But then on the other side, we see ourselves as being alive to God. Let's go now to Philippians chapter 2. To see another place where um, we're, we're brought back to the cross. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians 2 verse 1. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, Fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. These are wonderful verses that we all know and love so well. Verses about our Lord Jesus showing the, 
the humility of Christ as he went down all the way to the cross. And, you know, the point of these verses, I don't believe, is that the Lord Jesus died on the cross for your sins and my sins. I, I mean, that's true, but I don't think that's what the writer is getting at. He's just simply wanting us to to consider the 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 humility of the Lord Jesus as he comes from glory, being with the Father, going down, 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 being a servant. Um, and further humbling himself, going to the cross and becoming obedient to death, but not just to any death, the death of the cross. And this is the remedy to the problem that that they were experiencing there in Philippi, the contention that was going on in the assembly. And the word of God says, only by pride cometh contention. You know, pride and, and humility are somewhat difficult to speak about because I think we we all, myself included, very much feel a lack in ourselves when it comes to um, humility. But the Word of God speaks to those things very clearly. And I wanted to try to share a few remarks on the on the topic of pride, which is the opposite of humility. Pride is a is a horrible sin. Um, the Word of God says that a proud look is an abomination to God. It's something that He hates, and it's it's a root sin. Pride is a root sin. It it's something that can lead to many other sins. That's what, what made the devil the devil. Um, he was lifted up. Lucifer was. Um, pride shows the deceitfulness of the human heart, perhaps more than any other sin, because it's so easy to see pride in someone else, but it's so hard to see it in myself. And even if I do see it a little bit, it's hard to admit to it. A person may admit it may admit to various sins like anger or um, covetousness or, or saying the wrong thing, but it's it's rare for someone to say, "I was proud. Um, I was filled with self-importance and self-display." Um, it's a very deceitful sin, and pride is very competitive by nature too, because the more pride we have in ourselves, the more we dislike it in someone else. And so my pride tries to just work against somebody else's pride. Um, so there was strife here in, in the assembly in Philippi. There was some strife, some vainglory, some self-display. And so the writer brings them back to the cross to see the complete humility of the Lord Jesus Christ, to, to trace those steps downward that he took as he became obedient to death, even the death of the cross, and I think something like seven steps have been pointed out here. I don't think I could really um, bring that out. But one thing I like to consider here is that the Lord Jesus, despite going so low, was still God. He didn't stop being God. He was just as much God the Son on the cross as when he was with the Father. Someone has said that his, his personal glory didn't change one bit. His, his positional glory did. His personal glory did not. He was still the son of God. Um, but he, he no longer was with the father in heaven. He didn't have that display of glory. Um, that's what he laid by when he came down to earth. He emptied himself of that display of glory that he had with the father. And he goes to the cross. And on the cross, um, the Lord Jesus said, I thirst. I've considered that a little bit, just how ironic that is for the lord jesus is the creator the one who created water he says i thirst he was with the father he had all that that indescribable glory and power but he goes all the way down to the level of a dying thirsty man and so scripture says he was rich yet for our sakes your sake my sake he became poor that we through his poverty might be rich. So all that to say that when we're living near the cross in our hearts, it's going to produce that, that Christ-like humility in us. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Um, the proud look is, is very resistible to God, but the humble heart, the, the, the broken heart, the broken spirit is irresistible to God. Let's look at one other passage. Um, in 1 Peter chapter 2, one other passage, 1 Peter 2, I'll read a few verses there to look at another place where the cross is, um, is brought in. 1 Peter 2, 
uh, 13, <clears throat> excuse me, verse 13, submit yourselves, <clears throat> submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God, that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. And then verse 18, Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. And then down in verse 21, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, Neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously, who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. The context here seems to be submission, and there are a number of different spheres of authority that God has instituted, um, authority in the family, in the marriage, in the assembly, in the workplace, um, in the civil government, and he calls us to submit to that authority, to cooperate by, by placing ourselves willingly under that authority, and to help us in that way, the Apostle Peter brings us to the cross to show the perfect example of submission in the Lord Jesus Christ, a perfect man who did no sin, was was numbered with the transgressors. He was given the horrible death sentence of crucifixion. But what did he do? He committed himself to him who judges righteously. The Lord Jesus was God. He was equal with God. But he placed himself under that authority. You remember him in the, in the Garden of Gethsemane. He says, not my will, but thine be done. He placed himself under that authority and willingly went forward submissively and, and obediently. And so you and I, as, as disciples, as followers of Jesus Christ, should, should also know something about submission. Um, we should be good, if you could put it this way, at bowing to authority and taking a submissive role in, in life. And I, I realized recently that when I think about submission, I think about submission and you might say the bigger things like um, parents uh, and children children submitting themselves to to their parents and, and in a marriage a wife you know being called to submit to her husband or we as believers in the assembly we, we want to submit ourselves to the headship of Christ or perhaps as individuals we're called to go through a deep trial and submit in that way um, but I, I, I really have come to feel for myself that submission really starts in the circumstances of day-to-day -day life. Often things don't go according to plan. Um, there's trouble, there's disappointments in life, frustrations or challenges that we face, um, aches and pains that we have in our bodies as, as broken people living in this fallen world. And Job put it well when he said, man is, is born unto trouble like the, um, the, the sparks fly upward, I think is what he says. But all those little frustrations in life are, are opportunities, I believe, to, to submit, to say to ourselves, as for God, his way is perfect. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. And honestly, I, I wish I was, was better at, at submitting to the Lord in that way and taking those, those frustrations and challenges of day-to-day -day life and just, just laying them at his feet. Um, but when we submit in that way, in daily ways, um, I believe it, it prepares our hearts and puts us in a much better state, a much better position to um, submit to the larger things that the Lord might have for us, like a deep trial or something like that. It's been said that submission is perhaps the greatest preacher glory. There's, there's a beauty in submitting to authority. There's a beauty in you and I as believers submitting to our God, to our Lord. And there's healing in that, too. And when we spend time at the cross, I believe it does produce that submissive spirit in, in your heart and in my heart. So just um, one verse that I'd like to look at in closing in uh, Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. One verse that um, 
you might say, ties it all together. Galatians 2 and verse 20. The Apostle Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. This is the Apostle Paul speaking, formerly Saul of Tarsus, who was, was apprehended by God on that, that road to um, Damascus. Um but I don't think Paul ever got over the fact that he had been died for by the Lord Jesus, the Son of God, and he wanted to live his life with that in view. May his death be fresh to you and I. May you and I spend time at the foot of the cross. May our hearts be near the cross of the Lord Jesus. I honestly don't know how well I lived that out in my own life, but I see from, from Scripture and from the godly examples of other believers, I see the importance of living near the Lord Jesus and his cross in that way. Um, it produces wonderful benefits, wonderful blessings in our lives. We looked at three of them, um, deliverance, um, humility, and submission, but there's many others that we could look at in the word of God. Um, but may you and I, as believers, live out that belief that we have in the incredible person of the Lord Jesus Christ and his wonderful work that he did for you and I at the cross of Calvary. That's what I, I had to, um, to share. So maybe um, we'll just close in prayer. Our gracious God and loving father, we give thanks for the Lord Jesus for giving him to us that we can look to him as our savior, as our shepherd, our friend, as our object. And Lord, keep us pressing toward the mark of that prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Lord, help us to follow you in our lives. And we pray for help, the Spirit's help and liberty and strength that we would walk worthy of the Lord Jesus, that our lives would be agreeable to him. We just thank thee for um, um, these scriptures that we could consider. And we thank thee, blessed God, for always adding a blessing to thy word whenever it's read. We pray all this, Lord Jesus, giving thanks and thy own most worthy name. Amen. 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 Hello, Caleb. Um, thanks for sharing what you did. I have a, a question and there's a little bit of a preamble to it, but it's in regards to what you mentioned on humility and uh, Philippians chapter two. Um, just the way that those seven steps down are sort of, uh, we might call it like an antidote to pride. So uh, there's some verses that come before that. Um, in verse three and verse four, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. So in those verses, Paul is essentially providing uh, an exhortation to humility on the part of the Philippians. And then he provides Christ as the perfect example of it. But um, it has just struck me in looking at those verses in the past. Like if you take, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. There is, or at least I think can be, uh, a fear that keeps us from acting on that verse which is if i'm always looking to the needs of others who's going to look out for my needs and i wonder if you just have um any thoughts on how uh the verses here in philippians chapter two answer to that yeah thanks michael i i'd, I'd uh like hearing any thoughts that others had, but uh, perhaps that's a matter where, where we can definitely trust um, God. You know, scripture says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Um, I've enjoyed recently, um, I think in John chapter seven, um, the Lord Jesus spoke about the spirit of God and he refers to the spirit as rivers of living water flowing out of us. Well, maybe I'll just try to define that. 
John chapter 7. Um, and the last day, John 7, verse 37, and the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. The Lord wants rivers of living water to flow from my life and your life to bring refreshment to others. And scripture says, you know, he that waters will be watered also in his soul. And so I don't know if this is a real direct answer to your question, Michael, but if we commit our way to the Lord, we trust in him, commit our way to him, like Psalm 37 says, we, we know that he is going to provide for us and give us the refreshment that we need and bless us and make us a blessing. Um, I don't know if, if, that, if that helps at all, but I don't think there's going to be any lack in you or I by simply um, following what, what the word of God says. Again, appreciate any other, any other um, thoughts that there may be on that. And self is really crucified with the cross, isn't it? And so uh, uh, the new life is completely dependent on the leading of the Spirit of God and the guidance of the Word of God, uh, it it uh, self should not be entering in, should it? It it should be as you said. It's it. I died in Christ. Uh, I've committed myself to another, and God is no man's debtor. Thank you, Kyo. <clears throat> I fully enjoyed it. Um, when you mentioned that the Lord would go back to, to heaven, but decided to go through with the whole purpose of God here on earth. Uh, do you mean that the Lord had already achieved victory over the world without being yet crucified? Yeah, that was um, the verse that um, was referenced in Luke 9, 51, and it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up. He steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. I think that is putting the, the focus on his responsibility as a man. He was here as a man on this earth to simply declare the heart of God the Father, declare the truth of God. Um, and in that sense, he had done his job. He was rejected, but not because of any mistake on his part. Um, so that's his responsibility, but then there's God's sovereignty, and God's sovereignty, the Son of Man must suffer. So he did have to go forward to the cross um, from the standpoint of, of God's sovereignty. Does that does that help at all? I think that verse or the thoughts that I shared on that definitely do require some some qualifications, but just speaking simply about the Lord Jesus and his responsibility as a man on earth to show the heart of God. He, had, by this point, had done his job, and he could have gone out free. Yes, that does help. Yeah, thank you. And he would have gone all by himself. Hmm. That would be like the um, kernel of wheat that abides alone unless it, unless it goes into the ground and dies, and it brings forth much fruit. Yeah, that's very nice. He shall see his seed and shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. His death has produced so much fruit for the glory of God. Very beautiful. Appreciated your thought, Caleb, on uh, Isaiah 52. His visage was so marred more than any man in his form, more than the sons of men. Years ago, I heard a brother in a gospel meeting say that the Lord's physical disfigurement was beyond what any other man had ever suffered. And to try and justify that, he said the Lord was completely unrecognizable. And it just didn't commend itself to me. And I thought, well, there are those in war times who have been so disfigured you'd hardly know that it was a human form at all, um, let alone to e even know who they were as an individual. 
So there's three things with that verse that I've kind of enjoyed. First of all, as to what he received from the hands of man, there is no man that ever felt what was in the human heart behind the enmity that they had received physically from another. He knew perfectly the heart and the enmity and the hatred behind every blow that he received as none other ever could. And so in that sense, his visage was so marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. But secondly, as you're saying, it goes beyond that. And our, our faces, our visage gives expression to what we are passing through, whether uh, mental or physical anguish or suffering. And even in a hospital, you've seen the little charts where they want a patient to point to a series of faces. Where are you at? And it starts with a smile and it ends up to an awful grimace. Where are your, is your pain level at? And they point to the face that represents where they think they're at. And in that sense, even our form, you know, if you, and I, I don't want to use just crude illustrations, but if you were to hit your thumb with a hammer, um, it wouldn't just show up in your face. Your whole body would represent <laughs> how you're feeling. You know, the suffering of that that pain would be reflected in your actual form. So in the hours of darkness, no man ever suffered in a body as that man suffered from the hand of God. Was it not expressed in his face? Was it not expressed in his form? But God clothed that with darkness that man would never be able to look upon the sufferer of Calvary in those hours of darkness. And in that sense, in those hours of darkness, his visage was so marred more than any man in his form than the sons of men. But in that, kings are astonished at him when he sits upon the throne in the coming day of his glory. Why are they astonished? Because a man who was so humbled in the past, so rejected and scorned by men, uh, so reviled, so often the, the, the uh, object of men's crude humor and so on. Just today in this world, how many times is the name of Jesus Christ taken in vain? We couldn't count them. We just couldn't count how many times and in that sense his visage his outward representation what you see of him and his form his person in this world is still so marred more than any man there is no one whose name is so misused whose person is so abused even today in this world than the Lord Jesus Christ. And when he finally sits on the throne, kings will be astonished. And they'll say, this man, how can it be that this man is on the throne? So I think in those three ways, what he, he felt the hearts that were behind what he received. He suffered in the body as none other ever did in the hours of darkness. And even today, his outward representation, visage, what you see of him in this world is so disfigured, so disfigured, so misrepresented. And in that aspect, uh, professing Christianity has to hang its head because we're largely responsible for that. Anyway, I just enjoyed your thoughts. It's not often I've heard somebody take it beyond the physical disfigurement from the hands of man and try and sort of make it that it was beyond what any other human received as far as the actual physical marks. 
No, no, no. It's it. That's not it. It's far deeper, really, more profound than that. It's amazing to think of how misunderstood the Lord Jesus was. Brother Steve was speaking about his, you know, his representation as a person was so so damaged, almost his his public persona, and you see that a little bit in the following verses in Isaiah fifty three. It says. Verse 3, he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. We hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. So people so badly misunderstood the Lord Jesus and they saw him suffering and it's almost like they said he's getting what he deserved. You know, how how badly misunderstood could a you know a person possibly be? But like Brother Steve said, he's he's still misunderstood today. It's a hard thing to be misunderstood. Our human heart wants to be loved and wants to be understood, and it's pretty frustrating when someone misunderstands us and we feel it. But the Lord Jesus felt. Um, felt that far deeper than we can ever feel it.